Welcome, Welcome from Alpha, from Alpha to, Omega. to Omega. Hello and welcome to the 85th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Sunday, the 17th of June, 2018, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, we welcome back to the show Professor Andrew Kleiman to talk about the Communist Manifesto. This is part one of a two-part interview on the topic. I have the new monthly subscriber, Devin G, to thank, along, of course, with all the existing and loyal monthly subscribers. You can donate to help to keep the show going by hitting on that there PayPal button or signing up over on Patreon. If you want to leave a comment, please do it on the YouTube channel. And if you are a YouTube listener, please, please, please hit that subscribe button and give the episode a thumbs up. It will undeniably usher in the ultimate utopian communist revolution. Sorry for the low output of episodes recently. I have three more episodes in the bank and ready to go over the next few weeks. So stay tuned. I will also be making an appearance on the Swampside Chats podcast, which is available on SoundCloud and iTunes, to talk about MMT, the law of value, and Star Trek. Check it out. Swampside Chats is the best comedy podcast out there. Now, to the interview. Okay, Andrew, uh, so you were up last night reading the Communist Manifesto. Uh, can you describe a bit of the milieu of the times when Marx was uh, writing this work? Um, I don't quite know. Um, what I do know is, is that he was at that time and really throughout his life, uh, once he gets kicked out of Germany, um, you know, he was part of these... Um, dissident left uh, emigre communities um, and they had all kinds of ideological differences among themselves and so he was part of this uh, group that had um, decided to move over to his kind of uh, politics which was open instead of having secret societies was uh, proletarian oriented you know interested in the proletarian revolution and so this was the manifesto, uh, you know, of that. It, it, they called it a party, but they, they, they don't mean um, party like we mean party nowadays. There were, there were, there were no political parties uh, in the modern sense back then. They, what we would call it nowadays is a political current or, or, or tendency. You know, things, things were very bad for workers, and there were revolutions very shortly after this uh, document was published. Uh, and the document anticipated this. How come it's come to have such such a, a big place in Marx's work? Like it's probably nearly even more famous than Capital, which is his life's work, for such a short document. Well, I think part of it is that it is so short. In other words, if people read something by Marx, what is it that they read? You know, I, I, I don't know. Not volume two. How many people read Capital? Eight people? Um, <laughs> Right, but but so if you think of like where where people read capital, or where people read Marx, they, they they read it in college. They have some professor who signs something. What do the professors assign? They they sign the, the Communist Manifesto. Why? Because you know you're teaching well, you know one session or two sessions, you know on on Marx. Uh, you couldn't say read you know even volume one of Capital, much less three volumes of Capital. Um, and it'd be hard for people to understand, and it's, it's detailed. Uh, here you get a lot of ideas, and they're uh, presented in a punchy fashion. And um, there are a lot of his ideas uh, packed into this this document. Uh, so it, it's easy to discuss, relatively speaking. Like I, I was surprised. Well, just as you said, it's very punchy. It really is. It's. I found it extremely well written, full of quite a few famous lines. Definitely the open line is very famous. But it also, I found when you say it was quite condensed, there's a lot in there. I found that if I hadn't read Capital, I think a lot of it would have been 
kind of uh, confusing the terminology of surplus and exploitation and the technical senses in which Marx means them. I think it makes the document quite difficult in places. Oh, for sure. But compared to other things that he wrote, it's not. It, 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 okay, so a lot of what we say Marx wrote, he never prepared for publication. But even things that he prepared for publication, um, so, you know, he rewrote with how this is going to be read in mind. Uh, this is much more accessible than something like the poverty of philosophy, which was also, you know, again, some economic theory, um, but with an explicit political focus. Uh, and that was written, what, a year earlier. So it's of, it's of the same time. This is much easier than um, the, the manifesto is. It's much, it's much easier than poverty philosophy. You know, at, at what stage, at this stage when he was writing it, did did uh, Marx have his theories of capitalism sorted? It, it feels like it was largely there. Well, there's a lot of stuff that's not there, for sure. Um, and there are things he reverses himself on. Um, by the time he writes Capital, uh, there is still a strong sense um, that the standard of living um, of the working class is going to decline. There's a strong sense of that in, in, in the Communist Manifesto. By the time he writes um, Capital, y you don't get that. Um, you do get changes of, of views. Uh, you know, there's that kind of, uh, what, 10-point program, I guess we would call it, at the end of Section 2. You know, here are immediate measures. Um, right after the Paris Commune, um, he and Engels wrote a, um, an introduction or preface to the, the Communist Manifesto. And they said, look, you know, first of all, we said way back when, you know, that the measures depend on time and place, you know, what needs to be done. And so for that reason, don't put any special emphasis on, on those measures but second of all, all, you know, we've learned from experience. We've learned above all from the Paris Commune um, that the, the proletariat cannot, you know, lay hold of uh, um, the, let me see, I got it right here. The proletariat cannot, um, oh, he quotes, he quotes the Civil War in France, uh, which he, you know, wrote the previous year. This is the 1872 German edition, uh, the introduction to it or preface. Um, one thing especially was proved by the commune, namely that, quote, the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for its own purposes. Um, but instead, the, 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 the state machinery needs to be broken. Um, so, you know, he changed his mind uh, to a large degree, uh, e either that or he, he kind of thought, it was, it was outdated what they had written in 48. He says that passage would, quoting just before, or that, pa that passage would in many respects be very differently worded today. This program has in, in some details uh, been, be, been, been rendered antiquated. So he, he, he's saying it, it's antiquated what they were saying there. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that, that were there. Uh, in the manifesto that, you know, continue. There's some things clearly that were not worked out by that time, and, and there's some changes of views uh, around the edges. When Marx died, Engels uh, gave a eulogy. I think I'm getting this right. This is from memory. My memory is playing tricks on me, but I think I got this right. Uh, and Engels said, look, the, the theory of historical materialism or the her historical materialist perspective, that is due to Marx. It's not due to the both of us. It's that it was Marx alone, and he had it fully worked out in 1844 when he and Engels first met. So the manifesto is three and a half, four years later. So if we look at the manifesto, then what, what would we say was its main conclusions from it? I know that's a very difficult thing to say because there's quite a lot going on in it. But he makes a case for, for a revolutionary communism. Right. I, I, I think that there's something more specific going on. Um, 
so you have this political current or tendency, uh, and they're different from other left-wing tendencies, even even revolutionary ones. Um, and they call themselves the the communists. And what he he was at pains to do was to say, what is the uniqueness? What is the special character of of our perspectives? What are we for, in particular? vis-a-vis these these other groups so you get um you know this rather long section comparing uh their views and how they organize and so forth to the others um so what stands out for me is actually proletarian revolution so not just revolution but proletarian revolution and internationalism the internationalism of this I mean, is all pervasive, you know, of course, concluding with very famous uh, conclusion, concluding lines, you know, we're, we're working, we're working men or, you know, of all countries unite. Uh, you know, I think that's, that's extremely important for understanding his perspective. It's very important nowadays, um, you know, when we're faced with this uh, right wing nationalism, and uh, attempts by some people who think they're on the left to accommodate that. Uh, it's really important to reclaim this internationalist focus and perspective for the future, in, in my view. So, yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a revolutionary document, for sure. Um, but I, 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 think, I think that... that, that, that to really understand what's going on uh, in the document as a whole, you need to think more specifically about the, the Communist League. This was, the, the, well, they called themselves the Communist Party, but it, it was the, the Communist League that was the new organization. You know, where they stood vis-a-vis other, other kinds of tendencies. What is it about the system that Marx saw about capitalism that made him a revolutionary and not really a reformist? Oh, I, I, I doubt that there's anything to see that makes you like that. Um, you know, I think he drew theoretical conclusions, uh, not because of his personal experience or knowledge of existing conditions was was different from others uh he he just didn't think that the capitalism was going to be fundamentally reformable um and that that you know that's a theoretical um perspective based on understanding of, of history um but again the the key thing was to understand the revolutionary aspect, you have to understand that there were a lot of people trying to bring about social change by means of appealing to the middle class, uh, making deals with, you know, the rulers, um, and, and that was antithetical to Marx because his idea of, of the, the change was, was so deep. The, the change he wanted and the changes that he thought were, were needed. And he, he basically had the view that the people, you know, who do the work, make up the large body of society, they should be running their own lives. They should be free, you know, so that the liberation should not be coming to them as a gift from another's. They, they need to free themselves. Um, this was a very deeply rooted part of, of Marx's whole thinking, uh, was, was human development and this idea of, you know, people liberating themselves um, was fundamental to it. I don't know, is, is that a sufficient answer or is that clearer? Well, I suppose one of the things I've, I've, all, I've been thinking about a lot is about how come Marx was so adamant that the proletariat would be so revolutionary, say, as opposed to the peasantry of the times beforehand, and why he thought that it would be such a fundamental difference between those two, say, downtrodden classes. To understand that, I think, first of all, we, we did not have 
although he talks about, you know, modern communications, putting everybody in contact. I mean, now w- that, that's like all over the world, even in the, the most remote places. Uh, that did not exist in Marx's time. You know, that was a tendency that, that, that he saw coming, you know, and it was starting to happen. But, you know, if you're thinking about uh, having what we now call socialism in modern conditions in the industrialized West, which was at that time limited to parts of Western Europe and maybe maybe the United States, you, ha- you have to have an urban focus, um, if, that, if that's what you're thinking of. And that's what he was thinking of back then. You know, things changed a, a good deal later um, as, as capitalism developed and as he, he learned more about uh, non-Western peoples and, um, and so forth. But I think part of the answer goes to what you mean by a revolution. I mean, for Marx, a revolution is not just like different people taking over. You know, it's that's, – that's, that's the same old thing, you know uh, – what was it? You know, the old, the new cop, same as the old cop, whatever the the, the phrase is. Um, that, you know, that's not what he meant. So, I mean, the the question is, who could really fundamentally change the nature of the society such that it would would be um, production in the interest of the advanced uh, of, of, the, of the immense majority. Um, it's not that hard when you have that perspective as against to, as against, it's just like, who's going to like, uh, rise up. Um, you know, you have a question of what comes after that. Um, if, so if it's more than a question of rise up, it's like, who is really going to change the conditions or who's interested in, in really changing the social condition? It, it was clear to Marx. I think it's it's still pretty obvious that that uh, you know that's the the the, the working class uh, under capitalism. Okay, but I, I suppose what I'm I, I'm trying to get at as well is he 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 was seeing the large groups of workers working together in large factories and large foundries and things and stuff like this together in large numbers, and he thought that that was a part of. A, a new dynamic they weren't uh, scattered peasants working on their own land through the country that this clumping of say proletarians you know the low the lower classes together in large numbers that that dynamic alone could to those cla- the lower classes say essentially realizing their strength when they could see that they could go on strike and shut down large operations that this was itself a component in his thinking about why the proletarian was more revolutionary, say, than the peasantry that were more dispersed. Uh, well, the, disper- the dispersal, you know, the, the, the people living and working in, in large numbers well, it, it is an issue. And I, I was uh, I was relating to that um, when I talked about, you know, the modern means of communication and, and, and so forth. It, what we now think of is like everybody being connected. That didn't used to, to exist. Uh, as for the rest of it, I, I'm not aware of him saying things like what you said. What we have in capital, I didn't see it in the manifesto not, that I recall, um, but I, I don't remember things about, you know, strikes. What we have in capital is that um, Marx says at the end is that the, the proletariat is. United, organized, and disciplined by the very mechanism of capitalist production itself. So that's something along the lines of what you're saying, but it, it, I don't see it in the manifesto. And like maybe I'm reading into it. Maybe it's from reading lots of different stuff that that was how I, that was a part of my understanding of why he thought it was this was one of those tendencies in capital for grouping people together like that. You know, oh, it's, it's, very, very, very definitely. But it's not so much a matter of large workplaces uh, as such. Uh, In other words, in a lot of countries now, you know, like the United States, you don't tend to have, you know, big uh, steel mills, big auto factories where you got 30,000 people working. 
you got that in, in China in, in, a, in a big way. So you, you have somewhat less than that, but, but, but you still have the urbanization. You still have people coming together through modern communications. So some of the problems that, that, that he was confronting in terms of carrying out an internationalist perspective, some of those problems we don't have anymore uh, in terms of communication. So, so there's, there's the issue of, of you know, the, the unity and the discipline and the organization that come from the process of production itself. I think the, the, the gathering of large numbers of people in urban areas or even nowadays suburbs, I, I think that mattered a lot, and that, that was the basis for the, the, the factory, large-scale factories is, is, is getting people living together. But this idea of, of like learning through, through workplace strikes as such, um, that's... I wouldn't say it's not there, I, I, but I don't think Marx focused on that as such. To me, like one of the big reasons why I really like Capital Volume Ones Two and Three is how kind of it's a description of the current system, say you know, and it's a description of how it works, and it, it gives us deep understanding, standing, and scientific work. When we get to the Communist Manifesto, does Marx make hard and fast predictions? In the manifesto, there, 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 there are there are a couple of things that I would say around the edges that are hard and fast predictions. In the main, I think he's uh, seeing tendencies and uh, inferring that you know the tendencies will play out w- without being impeded or, or you know they'll tend to work out a, a certain way. There's one place where he says that the downfall of the bourgeoisie and the victory of the proletariat is inevitable. And it's hard to know what is meant by inevitable there. Uh, I mean, what, what if a meteor, you know, destroyed the earth? I mean, the, you know, that, that, that's a possibility, right? So was he unaware of that or does inevitable not include such things? Um, so it's, hard, it's just hard to know what he meant by, by, by that. And I'm not even sure that he, you know, that the, the way the term was, was regularly used, I'm not even certain that it, the, the, the modern connotations we give it were, were in effect back then. I, um, so I, I have some like questions in my mind about that, that one bit. Um, but I, I, yeah, I think that, that he's, he's looking at tendencies and, and saying, you know, this is what I think is likely to happen. But hard and fast predi- predictions in the main, no. Like, that's one of the classic kind of criticisms of the manifesto is that, like, you know, well, maybe capital, he's got it right, but in, in the manifesto, he made the proletariat is going to be revolutionary and we're going to push away through uh, capitalism and it's going to happen in Germany first and blah, 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 blah. And a lot of these predictions kind of semi-happened, didn't work out the way that Marx said it would in the manifesto. Well, I mean, there, there, there were revolutions in 1848 and 49, uh, right right after they, 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 they published this. Um, and so they weren't wrong about that. Um, you know, the revolutions were, were crushed, they were suppressed, there was a reaction. Um, so they were overly sanguine at that time about the, the prospects for quick and, and immediate success. Um, I have no doubt that, uh, you know, Marx changed his mind about that shortly thereafter. Because I just happened to uh, reread the... Um, the address to the, what was it, the Central Committee of the of the Communist League, where uh, this was 1850, and he says, um, you know, we have to have make the revolution permanent, and it might, you know, be 30, 40, 50 years till the the proletariat has gained the the experience and stuff. Throw off basically all of the um, middle class and 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 uh, bourgeois. Um, allies that it momentarily has against the, the specifically the um, not the class as a whole, but specifically 
I, I can't remember the word. Um, but ba- basically, you know, the, the the kings and stuff. Oh, the feudal, feudal lords or whatever. No, 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 no. The, this is uh, the ab- absolutist rule. That's that's what Absol- I was. Okay, yeah, absolutist. Okay, yeah. Cool. Very good. Yeah, absolutist rule. So there, there was a reaction after the 1848-49 revolutions, and there was, um, you know, a move toward, uh, back towards absolutism. And so, you know, uh, you had most of the liberals, uh, we would call them now, uh, and, and such, uh, capitulating to that. There were some elements that did not, you know, but but they weren't uh, proletarian elements. They weren't in favor of proletarian revolution and so forth. So Marx says, look, these people are, are temporarily our allies, but they're going to su- sell out the proletariat the moment they get, uh, the first chance they get. Um, and the proletariat has got to, like, you know, be very wary of this and just say, you know, okay, we'll fight alongside whoever right now, but we have our own aims and we have to be independent. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing now immediately is not the be all and end all. Um, the, the revolution, you know, the perspective has to be the revolution in permanence, a continuing, uninterrupted uh, revolution until we get to the, the new society. And, you know, he's, he, he's thinking of a very uh, prolonged uh, process. Um, this is by, by 1850. Prolonged, you know, 30, 40, 50 years is, I think, where, where the, the time frame he was thinking of then. 30, 40, 50 years. Do you think that the proletariat has ever been really the revolutionary class in history so far? This is a criticism people have that a lot of the time, that say like in the Russian Revolution, was the proletariat very revolutionary? Yeah, the the, the, pro, the proletariat was revolutionary in the in, in the Russian Revolution, the, the February Revolution, the the October Revolution, the nineteen oh five Revolution that preceded that. The people forget the proletariat was revolutionary in eighteen seventy one in, in Paris. The proletariat, by its nature, is revolutionary. Why do you say that? Because the the interests of of working people. Uh, is fundamentally opposed to that of of of, of, of capitalism. Um, so, you know, it, if they are going to gain freedom, this is the key point. You know, if they are going to gain freedom, it is not by making changes to the society, but by means of a different society. That that is what makes the proletariat revolutionary. Okay, that and. And, and, you know, it experiences oppression and, and rebels against that, that, that oppression, um, you know, and exploitation and, and domination and all of that. Um, and, you know, so, so people want to be free. Uh, that's the starting point of everything here. Um, and the, the proletariat cannot gain um, its freedom uh, by being led by others, by making certain modifications to the existing society by becoming a new ruling class, any of that stuff. The only way that the proletariat um, can gain freedom is by means of a wholly new, you know, the the destruction of the old society, the creation of a new society in which there are no classes, in which, you know, we don't have capitalism and it's, you know, production of so-called value and so forth and so on. So there is something about uh, well, the proletariat and something about uh, the creation of modern uh, conditions of production that really um, moves toward uh, a whole new society. And that's the revolution. So, what, like, we look at uh, back Marx's time and early 20th century, we had a lot of organized proletarians. How do, how do you look at the the state of the proletarian today as a revolutionary class? Well, they're really under the gun in a lot of ways. And one thing that that Marx really did not anticipate was the extent to which, so to speak, the counter-revolution would move into the revolution um, and co-opt it and disorganize it and cripple it. Um, What do you mean by that? well, we had Stalinism, first of all, which has dealt an immense blow to, to, to the working class. 
that we're still, you know, recovering from. I don't even know if we're recovering. Um, but then you've got these uh, so-called representative, you know, social democratic and similar parties um, that basically blunt and impede uh, proletarian organization and self-development um, and independence. Uh, and you've got uh, the trade union bureaucracy uh, with which those parties are often allied, and, and they, they've done the same thing in a very big way, um, impede, blunt, disorganized working people in the sense of the, in Marx's day, what, what he was putting forward was, was a perspective of, you know, independent working class self-activity. And, and nowadays, it's, it, it, we don't even think of that in, in the main, um, you know, we see signs of it everywhere breaking out. And then those people come in, you know, at the snap of a fingers and they're there to co-opt. They're there to take over. Um, so this is a huge problem. Uh, and this is, I, 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 I think this is the main reason why we don't see um, more uh, working class uh, activity that seems revolutionary. It doesn't have time to develop in, in a revolutionary direction, you know, before the organizations get taken over, they get co-opted, um, you know, the leaders get bought off uh, and, and so forth and so on. You know, there, there is something really important to be said for people whose way of life impels them in, in revolutionary and in, in an intransigent direction. Um, I mean, that's among the things that Marx saw about the proletariat. It, it cannot free itself within the society. The society is built on the gun freedom of the, you know, the worker for capitalism. That's, that's you, 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 you get rid of that, you get rid of capitalism. Um, so, so they're, they're impelled toward the new society. W without that objective relationship, it's very easy to go off in all kinds of directions. Uh, I mean, you have to, you have to understand, you know, 1848, and they call this the manifesto of the communist party. And we think of that in terms of modern political parties, you know, no, there were no modern political parties. You know, they came later. You know, really, one of the first major ones was the the, the Social Democratic Party, um, founded through unification in 1875 in Gotha. And, and you know, they, they, they designed this Gotha program, and some of these people called themselves, you know, Marxist, or they were thought to be, you know, the followers of Marx. And Marx said, look, I'm going to have nothing to do with this program, and, and I oppose this unification for this, that, and the other reasons. And, you know, so he, he, he wrote to us another short document, um, but that was not for publication. Um, that was so-called marginal notes. And it's much more difficult. Uh, that's the critique of the Gotha program. Okay, but that was, that was, you know, close to three decades later. You know, that's really the, the beginning of, of, of the political parties that we know and this institutionalization of institutionalization of things that supposedly are representing the working class instead of being working class. So getting back to you said earlier that um, Marx had changed his ideas by the 1880s, that he no longer he no longer thought that capitalism would lead to the immiseration of the proletariat. I assume this comes from right. Say, that was already that was already that was already there by by the the early mid sixties, if not before. Okay, I mean you you, you look at, at volume one of Capital, um, where he's got uh, part seven on the process of capitalist accumulation. There was no sense of that there. So and like wor no, nothing in the sense of worsening of the standard of living. You you get a lot of stuff that is you know very highly critical. And he says, um, the lot of the worker must grow worse. But what precedes the phrase, the lot of the worker must go, grow worse, is be his payment high or low. The lot of the worker must grow worse. So if you look even f further forward in the same paragraph or maybe the paragraph before, he's talking about uh, the whole of the worker's lifetime uh, being, you know, um, 
sucked away by working, you know, turned into labor time, the drawing of the, the, the kids and, and, and the wife, uh, I think he uses that expression, being drawn in, in, into production, you know, uh, female labor, uh, child labor, the, the horrible uh, alienation and just uh, terrible working conditions and, and, and so forth and so on. He, he, he does not have uh, a decline in the material standard of living in mind when he's, he's saying this. So he says, irrespective of that, be his payment high or low, the lot of the worker must grow worse. He's referring to all those other things. Well, like the, we, we have seen that the workplace has, in the West anyway, has, has probably improved you know, health and safety and, and stuff like that. Did Marx think that would not happen? Did Marx think that what would not happen? Well, sorry, let me, the let improvements me to, the, the improvements to, to, to workplace conditions? Yeah, like it seems to imply what you're, I, I'm just, like does, it, does what you're quoting there seem to say the opposite of what has happened in the workplace with health and safety. Right, well, yeah, I mean, what, what, I think one thing we have to come to grips with is a shift in the location of capital's production, not from one place to another, but in, in terms of shares of, of production with the globalization of capital. So much of production now, capital's production takes place in the third world. Um, from what I know, conditions are terrible uh, there, and, and their workplace conditions are, are, you know, they're not great elsewhere. There are laws, but the, in the United States, um, the enforcement of those laws is a joke. There have been continual battles, uh, even in, you know, in the United States against speed up, against uh, all, all kinds of conditions, uh, all kinds of wildcat strikes that, you know, people do not hear about. I don't know if you've got that term in, in, in yeah, Britain. We do, yeah. yeah. Um, no, it, it's just, it's interesting because what I'm trying to get at it is here is that, like, uh, if Marx was, at the time of writing of the Communist Manifesto, if he has since moved away from that kind of immiseration of the the proletariat, you know, it, it seems to me that 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 w would have an impact on the revolutionary nature of the, the proletariat as a class. It, it would if it were a big enough issue, such that you know people could work for for twenty years and then have saved up enough to to live a comfortable life without working. You know that would free them from sub coordination uh, to capital. Um, but that's not what happens. You know, what happens is people have a, a, a TV and a cell phone, maybe a smartphone, you know, and they've got a couch. <laughs> that, that doesn't change your life Im immensely. You know, the, the reality is you still have to get up every day and go to work whether you want to or not. A, a, you're producing something that you have no interest in. You're working under conditions with, that you have no say in. You're doing the bidding of, you know, other people, you know, for a motive that's not yours. Um, that's that's a really big deal. Oh, no, I totally do. But like, um, you know, if we look at say the Arab Spring revolutions that happened, which were you know, whatever, whatever we want to call them. But, you know, one of the big predictors for which countries had a revolution was, you know, the the price of food, price of bread and things like these went up, you know, double, triple in price for a while. And it really took from, essentially took away from the labor power, reduced the labor power, if you want to put it that way, of the working class. Um, but, you know, and, and, you know, that kind of immiseration tendency in those Arab countries, you know, led to revolutionary behavior. I'm just wondering, like, is just trying to interrogate how Marx's thinking about revolution changed with his with his changes in thinking about immiseration. Oh, I thought you were asking me my view. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm me, and Marx is Marx, and 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 obviously I'm not him. Um, or even your view, Andrew, as well. You know, like, you know, I'm just trying to right. I mean, my my my, my view is, is is what I shared w with you. Uh, I don't disagree with what you said about Arab Spring and 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 and, and riots over over you know or rebellions over ri rising prices of, of of staple goods and so forth. I, I don't I don't disagree with that, um, but. 
you know, there are, are, are still, even with the higher living standards, you know, people are still exploited and oppressed and so forth. Um, and this is their whole life, their, their whole life, you know, and you, you can't really reasonably escape this, uh, except in, you know, very rare and exceptional circumstances. There are exceptions. Um, but in the main, as a class, the working class does not escape this. Did this have any effect on Marx's thinking? I mean, he said, look, the, the, the best thing for the proletariat is to have, you know, booming industry, boom conditions rather than bust conditions. Did this affect, like, his view of the, whether the proletariat was a revolutionary class? Not that I can see. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like trying to think. I, I can't come across, you know, in my brain, in my memory, I can't. There's nothing that I can see that uh, would lead in that direction to that conclusion. So I suppose what I'm trying to just trying to build out the idea here about the revolutionary nature of the proletariat class. Like it seems to me that if ever there was to be a communist revolution that was successful, it has to be led by the proletariat. Our problem as say radical Marxists or whatever is how the hell do you get there? Are we going to be reliant on? like this kind of immiseration to be the spark that could lead to it. How many how many communist revolutions were there where things were quite well run at the time? You know, usually it, they seem to be closely linked to economic crises and uh, war conditions. Yeah, I mean, that that that, that is for sure. Um, People had wrong theories. They weren't thinking uh, about things in the right way. Uh, there's been substitution of the idea of a political takeover for real revolutionary transformation of social and economic conditions. There's a lot of things like that. But let me just say a word uh, about this word, uh, miserization or miseration. Um, Marx uses that term in capital. So he doesn't give up that word. You know, or, you know, increasing misery is the way it's often translated. Okay? So, you know, if people come away and say, Kleinman says that Marx, you know, gave that up, and ha, 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 it's here. Yeah, it's there, but he's not referring to um, a reduction in standard of living. He's referring to... A more general sense the, of immiseration, say. Yeah, the, the misery of one's life working yeah. for capital... You know, and the whole family being brought in and the, the, the work, which is, you know, uh, the working conditions are terrible and the, all, all, all of those things that he talks about before he says a lot of the worker must grow worse because payment higher or low. Okay, that, that's what it, that's. Yeah, I suppose it's quite interesting. That's, that to him is what he's referring to as misery. Yeah, yeah like as in if, if you talk to, say, somebody who's working today, you know, I think there's a lot of analysis out there about like, you know, the number of friends that people have nowadays is reduced. The the amount of social interaction people have nowadays is reduced. How closely people know the people in their neighborhood and trust them is reduced. And we're getting more and more isolated. Like that would be termed as a part of the immiseration of capital. Um. Yeah, well, I mean, look, everything in the society has something to do with capital one way or another. Um is, is, is the question in my mind is is this a necessary tendency of capitalism you know uh or is it just something that has occurred within capitalism and you know given various anarchic features of capitalist society um uh, they've done nothing to, to stop it from happening and they might be powerless to stop it from happening i mean it it, it seems that you know uh, social media uh and the internet have a lot to do with the, the kinds of uh, trends that you're talking about you know so they arose because of capitalism and you know the the profits and so forth um for you know have, having a, a new app or whatever it might be um and and facebook and all of that so even so they wrote you know even television or you know yeah like right so these things are these things arise within capitalism and the capitalist class has its eye on something better than you know something different than the bettering people's conditions so they, they don't care about this fundamentally so 
And they, they don't stop, but also we don't know if they have the power to stop it. There's a lot of things that they create that they might not want, but they don't have the power to stop. Because, um, you know, there's a social system there. It's not just like decisions of people. Um, but, you know, is this just something that happened, a historical contingency that could have gone a different way? I, I, I just don't know. It does, seem um, to, it does seem to be like in capital that they have, like certainly when they have choices in development, they go for ones that are more atomizing over ones that are more social, like the design of houses, of neighborhoods, of streets, of you name it. I don't know. I can I can think I can, I can think I can think of exceptions. I you know I think of company towns in in uh, the coal mining regions. I think of um, you know uh, Fox was it Foxconn? Y yeah, I think it's, I think it's officially Taiwanese. You know, but they're they're there in China and and they have four hundred and seventy five. Maybe they've downsized now, but they they, they had over four hundred thousand people working in one place. You know, and and they're all congregated there in in, in company housing, um, and so they're all they're all brought together. I mean, the, 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 this was not a question of like, okay, let's let's build tract homes for these people so that they'll all have their little plot of land and think of themselves as an owner. Uh, that was not definitely what, <laughs> what was going on there. We'll just put them in dormitories, uh, <laughs> it's like my boarding school. Yeah, I mean, they were living basically in, in dormitory. Conditions. I think they were even sharing beds. Even worse, you know. You know, people on this shift are working here. You get to sleep, and you know, when their shift is over, you'll be working, and they use the same bed. I think. I think. I don't quite remember, but uh, I think I read that. So it sounds like living on a submarine. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, by Sunra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. <laughs>